Hometown Ghost Stories contains serious and often distressing events and is not intended for all audiences. Viewer discretion is advised. Monday, November 25th, 1974, Bridgeport, Connecticut. It had begun to rain outside. Jerry watched as his 10-year-old daughter, Marcia, played Monopoly on the living room floor with Barbara and Paul. It was her favorite game. Marcia felt safest with Paul and Barbara around. When Marcia felt safe, Jerry could typically relax a little, but not today. He had that feeling again. It started with tightness in his shoulders and then throughout his whole body as he felt the atmosphere become heavy. Nobody else seemed to feel it, so Jerry tried to shake it off, but he knew something was about to happen. He knew there was a dark force at work in his home. Marcia, who was lining up the little Monopoly houses on the carpet, suddenly looked up as the fluorescent light started to flicker. Something that was normal in cold temperatures, but they were in their living room and the thermostat read 70 degrees, so there was no precedent for the flickering light. The Monopoly game came to an abrupt halt as the framed painting of The Last Supper came crashing to the floor. Marcia screamed and Paul jumped to his feet. Jerry looked over at Paul, who looked back both seeming to acknowledge the feeling in the air. The pressure of the heavy atmosphere felt like it moved past Jerry and the four people in the room watched as the couch moved on its own, turning about 35 degrees. Something extraordinary was taking place. Jerry heard his wife Lara sobbing from inside the bedroom, but nobody could move. On the other side of the room, the air began to shift as a cohesive assemblage of smoky yellowish-white gauzy mist materialized. At first, it was an indistinct cloud, but as they watched on in a state of amazement and fear, it began to separate into four distorted, transparent figures. Barbara gasped and made the sign of the cross with her hand. What's that smell, Marcia cried. Jerry thought it smelled like sulfuric acid or ozone from a generator. Jerry was suddenly overcome with an uncontrollable feeling of anxiety and began humming in a very low tone. The other three people in the room looked over at him, confused, perhaps not recognizing his voice. All of a sudden, he began reciting a Gregorian chant in Latin. He chanted the Mass of the Dead and the Mass of the Angels, which is recited when a child dies. Marcia was crying and clung to Paul's leg as the rain pounded against the windows. Jerry's anxiety inexplicably turned to rage as he began reciting louder. The four misty figures seemed to grow almost as if they were feeding off his energy. One of the figures moved towards Paul, who instinctively stepped in front of Marcia. As he did so, the smoke bumped him. He felt it physically, as if it had a tangible structure, knocking him off balance. Suddenly, Marcia was lifted and physically tossed across the room. The girl screamed. Paul ran over, scooped her up, and all of the terrified people in the house ran outside into the stormy night. I'm Dave Wilkins, and this is Hometown Ghost Stories for Lindley Street Poltergeist, Bridgeport, Connecticut. Settled in the mid 17th century as part of the township of Stratford. Bridgeport incorporated as a town in 1821 and a city in 1836. While early settlers farmed and fished, they soon took advantage of their location on Black Rock Harbor and shifted from an agrarian community to a mercantile and manufacturing hub. Throughout most of its history, Bridgeport remained a quiet suburb town, but in 1974, it reached a level of infamy that nobody could have seen coming. It became home to the most well-documented case of poltergeist activity ever. Not long after their wedding in 1960, Gerard and Laura Gooden purchased their home on Lindley Street in Bridgeport, Connecticut. Gerard, better known as Jerry, was a Catholic man who had been a maintenance man for 23 years and was considered a straightforward, down-to-earth guy not known for having his head in the clouds. Laura was a full-blooded Native American who grew up in a home where no other children her age lived nearby. Because of this, she had a hard time making friends. 
but her and Jerry made for a very compatible couple. They welcomed the birth of their son on Halloween in 1961. He seemed like a perfectly healthy baby in every way until one day their neighbor pointed out that his head would always seem to hang down. Laura had noticed it before, but hadn't put much thought into it. At first, the doctor said it was nothing to worry about, but after six months and no changes, Jerry Jr. was diagnosed with cerebral palsy. The Goodens spent nearly all of their time and money on the child, ordering him a special chair and leg braces, but he would only live to the age of six, passing away just three days before his seventh birthday. This naturally devastated the couple, and to make things worse, the day after the burial of their son, Laura needed to have a hysterectomy to remove a tumor, leaving her unable to have any more children. The grief was unbearable. The Goodens kept a shrine to their son in the living room for about six months until they decided that a home without a child wasn't a home at all. They took down the shrine and went to inquire about adopting a child. They immediately fell in love with four-and-a-half-year-old Marcia, a full-blooded Seneca Native American girl who was the youngest of a family of nine and the only one of her siblings put up for adoption. The Goodens cared dearly for their new daughter, and the only criticism neighbors seemed to have is that they were very overprotective. Laura wouldn't let Marcia out of her sight, walking her to and from school and refusing to let her play with other children. This led to Marcia not having any friends. When asked about it, Laura said that since she grew up without friends, she didn't see the need for them. She also said that she wasn't going to let Marcia out of her sight for fear that she would die. This caused Marcia to resent Laura. Things started to get bad when Jerry's hours were cut back at work. Marcia had to be transferred from a private school to a public school where she was relentlessly bullied. The kids would call her horrible names and make racist remarks about her Native American heritage. One day, she was attacked and beaten by a group of boys, one of whom kicked her so hard she needed to be placed in a pelvic brace. Laura and Jerry immediately pulled her from school and decided to homeschool her, effectively cutting her off socially. Marcia wasn't the type to lash out. She would keep her emotions bottled up inside. Paranormal experts agree this is the prime condition necessary for the invitation of a poltergeist. It all started before the family even realized anything was happening. Objects would go missing or would be found out of place. These events were usually chalked up to coincidence, but in 1969, several years before the haunting went mainstream, came the first real incident that caught the attention of the Goodens and family members. The Hoffmans were family friends to the Goodens and would often come over for game nights and other gatherings. They had a daughter, Rosemarie, who was close in age to Marcia and was probably the closest thing she had to a friend. The duo would often sit on opposite sides of the couch in awkward silence. One day, while the adults were conversing in the kitchen, Rosemarie and Marcia sat on the couch in the living room. Rosemarie tried to make conversation, but Marcia didn't know what to say, so remained silent. Suddenly, the couch rumbled ever so slightly. What was that? Rosemarie asked. Marcia said nothing, but looked frightened. The couch rumbled again, a little harder this time. The girls exchanged a look of panic as Rosemary's end of the couch slowly rose into the air about six inches before crashing back down with a loud thump. The girls shrieked, causing the adults to come rushing into the room. Neither of the frightened girls could articulate the events that occurred, so the adults brushed it off as nothing. Somewhat surprisingly, this event sparked an increase in interaction between the girls. They became closer and even began playing together in the yard rather than sitting on the couch in silence. One afternoon, the Hoffmans came over for a visit and Rosemarie ran into Marcia's room to find her sitting on the couch with her legs crossed, rocking back and forth, talking softly in a language she didn't understand. Marcia, Rosemarie called in a panicked voice. Marcia snapped out of it and looked at her friend. She explained that she had been talking with their grandfather who was displeased that the Goodens had taken her from their tribe. From 1971 to 1972, Jerry was repeatedly abruptly awoken by loud pounding on the side of the house. It was not a knock at the door, but rather a deafening slam against the side of the house. Again and again and again. He couldn't identify where the sound was coming from, night after night. Eventually, he called his friend and neighbor, John Holsworth, 
who was a police officer with the Bridgeport Police Department. John suggested they make a recording to show to the police. They set up a tape recorder at 3 a.m. and proceeded to record the pounding. It started in the kitchen and followed John and Jerry throughout the house as they walked room to room. They presented the tape to the police department, who along with the fire department and various other city officials investigated but were unable to determine the cause of the pounding. The intermittent pounding continued through 1974 when things again became worse. One early autumn evening, Jerry and Laura sat in their living room when Laura suddenly jumped up out of her seat. She pointed to the window where they both saw the image of a disembodied hand on the other side of the glass. They ran out the front door to investigate but found nothing outside the window. On another night, Laura heard three loud knocks on the front door. When she opened it, nobody was there, but she looked down and saw two wet footprints on the stoop. A chill crept down her spine as she realized the footprints were of bare feet, and it was a completely dry evening. Early autumn turned into late autumn, and on November 21st, things yet again grew worse. Jamie and Janet Hallsworth, John's wife and 14-year-old daughter, were over visiting with Laura and Marcia when there was a crash in the master bedroom. When they rushed in, they saw that the window had been broken from the inside. The interior pane was shattered, but the outside pane was untouched. Nobody had been in the room. The next day, Jerry, Laura, and Marcia sat in the living room watching TV when they heard strange sounds coming from the master bedroom. When they went in to investigate, they saw that the window shade had been rolled up and the curtain had been flung from the rod. Jerry replaced the items, only to watch as they were again thrown from the wall as they watched on in horror. Jerry joked to try and lighten the mood. Whatever it is, it doesn't like curtains, he joked, but nobody laughed. The following day, November 23rd, the family went on a day trip. When they returned, Jerry found Marcia's TV, which had been high up on a shelf, face down on her bed, with the cord and antenna wires hanging from the back. Confused, he left the room to find Laura. As he walked into the kitchen, he saw dishes floating out of the sink and flying around the room, smashing off walls. Laura walked into the doorway just in time to see all the knives float out of the knife block and fly towards Jerry. She called out to him and he ducked out of their way. Just then, the kitchen table slowly rose off the floor and flipped over, sending all of the groceries crashing into the wall. Laura heard something behind her and turned to see the 300-pound refrigerator hovering a foot off the floor. Immediately after that, the heavy wooden TV stand next to the sink tilted, sending the TV toppling off the edge, smashing down on Laura's bare foot, bursting two of her toes. She screamed in pain. Jerry scooped her up and instructed Marcia to get into the car. He carried his wife to the car and brought her to the emergency room. While they were away, chaos of the house continued. The following day, officers Carl Leonzi and Joe Tomac were on patrol when they received a call regarding unusual activity at a house on Lindley Street. When they arrived, they found the Goodens and several other family members, including their fellow officer John Holsworth, in a very distressed state. They explained to the officers that a couch had lifted off the floor and slammed back down. Dishes were flying around and smashing. The refrigerator had lifted off the floor and bumped into John, and the recliners were violently reclining and unreclining in rapid succession. The officers entered the house, and Officer Tomek picked up the TV set and put it back on the bureau, where it sat for a moment, and then, to his astonishment, proceeded to float up in the air and swing left to right like a pendulum. He looked around to see if something were propping it up, but found nothing. The officers witnessed many other unusual things and called for backup. One policeman, Officer Leroy Lawson, witnessed a crucifix pull itself from the wall, nail and all, and projectile itself directly into his chest. It bounced off, and Officer Lawson exclaimed, That's it. I'm out of here. Several other officers arrived along with ten firefighters, including Assistant Chiefs Messina and Paul McKenna. They all witnessed the TV rise up and flop over. A crowd of people began to gather outside the house as word of the haunting got around. Mary Pascarella, a neighbor, made her way through the crowd and into the house. Mary was a psychic medium and wanted to test the theory that a child can act as an unconscious agent for poltergeist activity. The tests were unsuccessful, but Mary had another idea. 
A year prior, in 1973, Mary had performed a seance in Harrisville, Rhode Island with the famed paranormal investigators Ed and Lorraine Warren. She called them after leaving the Goodens' house and filled them in on everything. They took an immediate interest in the events and made the short trip to Bridgeport from their home in Monroe. When they arrived, Ed had to park four blocks away due to the thousands of people crowded around the house. The Warrens brought along a priest by the name of Father Charbonneau and a 21-year-old seminary student named Paul Eno. They began interviewing the policemen, firemen, and other witnesses. The Gooden family welcomed the help, and Marcia remarked that it was fun having so many people in the house. Ed took Paul aside and instructed him to stay with Marcia at all times, partly to ensure her safety and partly to make sure the girl wasn't causing any of the paranormal activity intentionally. Ed then called the police superintendent and informed him that there was poltergeist activity in the house. During the course of the Warrens' investigation, they, along with the policemen and firemen, witnessed endless amounts of paranormal activity, including recliners rising up to the ceiling, the family cats swearing and making off-color remarks to some of the policemen, furniture moving, an ashtray levitating in the air and exploding into shards of glass, and mysterious banging sounds. Lorraine Warren would experience nausea when entering Marcia's room, and while sitting at the kitchen table with the Goodens and Paul Eno, they noticed a burn appear on her hand near her wrist. The crowd outside continued to grow, and by now included several news reporters. The police had barricades set up, but some of the people would sneak through and peek into the windows, catching glimpses of the furniture floating around. Father Charbonneau and Ed believed they were dealing with a demon and wanted to perform an exorcism, but the Monsignor at the church didn't agree. Despite the lack of cooperation from the church, Ed and Lorraine left the house to head back to their home in Monroe to gather items necessary for an exorcism. While they were gone, the Goodens, Paul Eno, and a family friend, Barbara Carter, saw the entity manifest in the form of four smoky figures. The five people who experienced this ran outside. Paul ran through the crowd to the neighbor's house to call the Warrens and inform them of the incident. They returned to the house around 9.15 p.m. and proceeded to the basement with Father Charbonneau to bless the house. While they were down there, the priest noticed an odd-looking shadow in the corner of the basement. He approached it and noticed that the shadow wasn't on the wall, but standing a few feet in front of the wall. He could completely walk around it, and when he passed his hand through it, it felt like a cool mist. He asked Ed and Lorraine if they could see the entity, and they nodded. They were convinced it was a demon. The following evening, November 26th, Officer Mike Costello was posted at the Goodens house. He sat in the living room with Marcia and her parents. Officer Costello witnessed a few abnormal occurrences with the recliner Marcia was sitting in, but was suspicious that she might be causing them herself. Two other officers knocked at the door and Jerry got up to let them in. While Jerry and Laura were talking with the officers, Officer Costello saw Marcia move her leg out and push the TV a few inches with her toe. Just then she caught his eye and he gave her a gotcha look and smiled. He quickly phoned the police superintendent, who was eager to wrap up the Lindley Street fiasco, and informed him that he believed the whole thing was a hoax perpetrated by the girl. The superintendent urged Costello to interview the girl and get her to admit to it. In a subsequent interview with officers Costello and Del Toro, Marcia admitted to many of the unusual occurrences, including moving the TV, faking the cat's voice, and toying with the recliner. She also admitted she witnessed Lorraine Warren burn her own hand intentionally by holding it under hot water. After the interview, the police left the house and officially ruled it a hoax. This is when things went from bad to worse. Without the police presence, the crowd, which was estimated to be around 4,000 people, was unrestricted and people piled onto the lawn. News reporters began reporting on the hoax, blaming Ed and Lorraine Warren and accusing them of drugging the family with candy laced with hallucinogens. The family had a hard time leaving and returning to the house with the unruly crowd. One person even grabbed at Marcia, tearing a pocket off of her shirt. On another occasion, two men were arrested and charged with attempted arson for lighting the house on fire with the family still inside. Luckily, somebody noticed the smoke and the fire was extinguished before it got out of hand. The men claimed they were trying to rid the home of evil. After that, 
The police re-established a perimeter to ensure the safety of the family, but would not entertain any further claims of paranormal activity. Ed and Lorraine Warren vehemently denied claims of a hoax, quoting, No ten-year-old child weighing 70 pounds could have created such a hoax in full view of policemen and firemen for that length of time. Despite the Warrens' denial, the Goodens demanded they leave the property at once. Eventually, the hype died down, but things didn't get better for the Gooden family. Jerry was harassed at work, and the family was financially unable to replace many of the items that were destroyed during the incidents. The paranormal activity hadn't stopped either. The family had gone along with the hoax story in hopes that the crowd would lose interest, but the haunting never stopped. Furniture continued to float around, and objects would continue to smash against walls. New officers who hadn't been into the house, but were called to the house, witnessed the strange happenings as well. In mid-December, the family left the house for a getaway to New York. They left the house in pristine condition, but when they returned, they found it completely destroyed, with all of the furniture overturned and their beloved statue of Madonna lying on the floor with its thumbs removed. Laura believed that the force was getting stronger and wanted to kill the family. Shortly after, a paranormal investigator named Boyce Beatty reached out to the family, and on December 18th, he, along with several members of the Psychical Research Foundation, began a scientific investigation of the house. They interviewed the family, Ed Warren, and Inspector Clark, who was the police official responsible for closing the investigation and declaring it a hoax. Everyone interviewed, including Inspector Clark, agreed that they did not believe it was a hoax. Clark was pressured to close the case by his superiors and took Marcia's cursory admission as the chance to alleviate the police from public scrutiny. The interviews wrapped up in January of 1975. The Duke University abstract contained a preliminary report entitled A Perplexing Poltergeist. They conducted a series of psychological tests on the family members and determined them to be of sound mind. They determined the phenomena to be genuine and that the events occurred in full view of witnesses and eliminated all other possible causes. The Lindley Street case would end up being the best documented case for poltergeist activity in history. What's going on, ladies and gentlemen? Welcome into Hometown Ghost Stories, episode number 50. We made it to 50 episodes, ladies and gentlemen. We did it. I'm happy. And uh, thank you to everyone in chat who has been there. If it wasn't for all of you and everyone who listens to the podcast and everything, we definitely would not have done 50 episodes. But we're here now, and uh, we're back. We're back for 50. It's October. Spooky season is raging on, and uh, we are investigating the Lindley Street Poltergeist. I'm joined by Rob Coakley. What's up, Rob? How long do you think that I could prop Dave's corpse up as a Halloween decoration before people actually realize that it's his corpse? It is that it is the only time of year that you can do that. You do that around Christmas, people might get a little suspicious. Although, throw a little Santa hat on him. Yeah, a little beard. Yeah, put, well, put him in a sleigh. Beard, paint that beard white. Yeah, we're also joined by uh, by Dave. What's going on? I think um, the Halloween being like a, an excuse to get away with murder is something that I feel like could be so much bigger. Like I always like, we used to go to like these haunted houses, right? And we'd be, you'd see the guy come in with a chainsaw. I'd be like, with a chainsaw. And I'd be like, man, what if some crazy dude just went into a haunted house with a chainsaw? Like nobody, everyone would be like, oh no. And then just get, you know, hacked to pieces or something. So there's some it's really fun Halloween movies or horror movies that are based upon that where, like things are actually happening in the haunted house that people go to. It's like, oh, this is really great. It's just people actually getting like hacked up by chainsaws and stuff. I've seen a few movies and I always enjoy them. Some of them are bad, but they're still like those trashy, fun, bad ones. Yeah. I've always said this. Like, have you guys gone on like a haunted hayride? Yeah, yeah. of course. Yeah. <laughs> yeah uh, no, I, I, I always <laughs> think that, like, here's an idea for anyone that runs a haunted hayride who may be listening. Have you guys heard of Halloween? Have 
<laughs> have actors on the hayride pretending to be people. And forgive me if if this idea has already been used, but it's been done. Has it where like people run up and just pull those people right off the hayride? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, well, thanks for spoiling all the fun, but I thought yeah. I had a great idea. Yeah. Turns good out idea. I didn't. Also, good I thought idea. I had a good idea last last episode with the uh with the Coliseum. And it turns out that was the uh that was the plot for some movie. I think I got called out in chat by Matthew Thomas or someone. So <laughs> I hadn't seen that movie, but I thought I had a good idea going there. But we don't have to go back to that. Right. We do um, horror movies, that's it. <clears throat> Right. That's true. Yeah. So uh, welcome to everybody who's hanging out in, in live chat for the episode 50 celebration. Uh, the Church of the Stephanie's cult leaders are here. Uh, Stephen, Matthew T, uh, Facebook user, who I'm assuming is Jackie and Tommy. <laughs> she still just pops up as Facebook user. So, <laughs> welcome in Facebook user, <laughs> if that is you. And uh, everybody else is hanging out. We appreciate you guys. A um, lot of content coming out this month. We dropped the uh, one of the editions of the History of Ghosts. So if you guys check that out on YouTube, a lot of this content is on YouTube. We're going to be pumping up more horror movie reviews and everything. So uh, we're working hard for you guys this October. It is an exciting. I month. will be dead by the end of the month, probably. Yes. And we'll have no space left on our computers to store all these <laughs> video files. <laughs> computers will also up. be dead. Yeah. So anyways, uh, so th this case is good. This is like Enfield Poltergeist part two, basically. I mean, obviously it had nothing to do with the Enfield Poltergeist, but so similar to that case where you had um everything from the idea of it being a hoax uh it involving the children people thinking that the kids are pulling off a prank the warrens being involved i think they were more heavily involved in this case than they really were in the enfield case but we already went over all that very similar type situation and it's another poltergeist and this one has some uh some compelling stuff and some very interesting stuff we always say on this show that we appreciate when a haunting has different kinds of hauntings and you can go down the list, but we have a swearing cat and we have a, uh, 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 st thumb of a statue stealing poltergeist. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Did you just turn to the fawns. What is happening up in that corner? <laughs> I had to show the thumbs on screen. Hey, in case, yeah. In case people needed to see what thumbs it. look like. <laughs> yeah. I still I have my thumbs. Poltergeist hasn't stolen my thumbs yet. Uh, yeah. Uh, this yeah. one had a couple of, um, unique things obviously I had a lot of the same things you get the moving furniture you got the knocking that you know starts off with the knocking and the banging but then it escalates to swearing cats and there's there's a, a set of whispering swans there's also that I didn't, that I didn't okay. mention so <laughs> just want to reference the chat real quick Rachel B says she made it missed the whole story but just made it so the first thing she's hearing is about whispering swans and swearing cats and if that's how you're coming into this episode you must be like what the hell is going on but continue so uh yeah so those were two things so the the whispering swans thing came i didn't mention it in the uh, opening video um because it was i was trying to keep it under you know an hour <laughs> oh, sorry. A long story. <laughs> to keep it scary that's just uh, whispering swans sounds like a like a a traveling group of acoustic <laughs> violin players it's, uh... <laughs> It's definitely like a hotel in the Berkshires or something like that. Come stay at the Whispering Swans. Yeah, the Whispering Breakfast Swans. or something. Yeah. Whispering Swans Resort. <laughs> yeah. Whisper the um, Whispering Swans Reading Room. Like, that's what it sounds like. <laughs> so the uh, the swans were uh, two, like, stone swan statues that the family had on the front, like, either side of the front porch of their insanely small house. I don't know if you saw, if you're not, if you're just listening, you didn't see the uh, pictures. You, got, you can go Google this house. It's the size of a shed. Look at um, that. Dave, Dave's, Dave's doing a renovation yeah. on his house. All of a sudden, he's got to shame everybody yeah, else. Shaming now. everybody else's home. I'm going to leave. I, have I didn't realize you lived in a peasant dog house. <laughs> I have water pouring in every single room in my house right now, so I can't talk shit. <laughs> uh, it's literally running down the walls. Um, it's still amazing to me that your office has remained relatively intact. Because it's insane. The, the rest of my house is studs and just drips of water like a horror movie. And <laughs> Like this room is like untouched. Thank you God. You basically you have a set. Like you people have people who are a, watching are like he's lying. <laughs> like, <there's> no, <laughs> he's not really no. renovating his house. Yeah. If your webcam wasn't attached to your computer right now, I'd say do a quick little walk around. But you don't have to. Yeah. I can't. I can't. No, I don't want to yeah. risk uh, the connection or, issue either. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> um, to walk three so, feet, I mean, it's not going to work out. So just to wrap up the whispering swamp thing, because it's stupid. Um, people, all the people who crowd, like this house gathered like a very large crowd, which is not a common thing that happens in hauntings. Um, and all the people that were outside kept saying they heard the stone swans whispering. Um, so that's what that was. It was never like verified. So the unverified whispering swans, basically. <laughs> unverified whispering swans. 
And um, and the talking cat was debunked. That was one of the things that the girl ended up admitting that she was doing. She was faking the voice. And um, a f- kind of a funny thing about that is the cops were going along with it. So um, when at one point in the uh, house, because the house was once the haunting was reported to the police, the police and the fire department and also investigators were living at the house and were just there, you know, day in and day out. So the cops were messing with this other cop because the other cop was like, I got to hear about this talking cat. And he, they, um, his buddies pulled the girl aside ahead of time. They're like, hey, this cop's going to come up to you. And he's going to ask you about the co- talking cat. The talking cat. Tell him the cat said his name's, his brother's name is Frank. So the cop comes over. He's like, and he covers his name badge. And he's like, hey, can your, does your cat know my name? And she goes, no, he didn't say your name. But he uh, said to say hi to your brother, Frank. And the guy's like, oh, get me out of here. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a solid, it's a solid prank. At least they're Absolutely. doing good pranks. Uh, yeah, I mean, so, I mean, you gotta still have fun with it, right? Even if you're being haunted, I would, I would definitely still like do stuff like that. Try to make light of the situation. Just to go off topic for a second, Stephanie says, uh, speaking of books, Sydney's 11th birthday is November 27th. Uh, she's wanting true ghost story books. I've been looking, but I haven't really come across too much. Any recommendations, please? Um, what, what is the one that that you would recommend, Dave? Is it Coast to Coast Ghosts? Yeah, actually, I think that's a, probably a good one for. Um... An 11 year old some of them so this the coast to coast ghost is written by a cop who did a lot of crime scene so i would want to you i would if i were you i'd read that one first and then if you think it's appropriate for an 11 year old or um or the one that the one the one that i brought up on she said it's her, it's her 11th birthday so she be turning 11 um the one that i had brought up about the enfield one seemed like a pretty harmless book it was uh this house is haunted I mean, all this stuff would have scared the hell out of me when I was that age. But I mean, she seems to be into it since she watches the show anyways. If you're into this stuff too, another good set of books is the weird books. Like I have the weird Massachusetts book. I'm sure there's a weird um, Tennessee book where it's just full of a bunch of stories that include ghost stories and other things around your state. I'm not I'm not going to 100 percent say there's a weird Tennessee one, but I, I would assume there's one for almost every state. I think they do one for for all the states. We got the weird yeah. New Orleans one, which was pretty good too. Yeah. So, uh, with that being said, let's get back into the haunting. So we had uh, we've moved on from the whispering swans, which, by the way, um, this was brought up. Clearly, we haven't. Said, we've been bringing it up four, for twenty minutes now. He said four thousand people heard whispering swans. It, yeah, it's like if you have such a crowd outside, like, how are you going to hear a statue whispering? So I don't know, but yeah, it's a full well, I, I think that they. Uh... I mean, it was the crowd was like they weren't all packed into that tiny front yard. They were all over the street and everything, and you couldn't park on the street. And um, they had like snack stands set up, like people were selling snacks to each other and and whatnot. It was pretty pretty crazy. You don't hear about stuff like that a lot. So that was one of the things about this that set it apart from the others. And what the other thing people were doing is, so the police had a barricade set up in the front yard right they weren't letting people onto the property but you know there's so many people they can't keep track of it all the time people were sneaking in and going up to the windows and they said there's several witness accounts of people saying they just saw furniture flying around and crashing into walls through the windows who knows if that's people just you know fanatics just saying they saw something to have a cool story or they actually saw it because um you, you, it's hard to tell with this one because this one uh, kind of reminds me of the Viacos case where you had the police that also witnessed the haunting mm-hmm. and I, I give the you, you take the police as sort of like almost like an objective. You kind of buy it more, right? Because the police, there's their jobs to be to rule out the crazy people, right? And um, you have a dozen witness accounts of police officers and firefighters high up, like assistant chiefs and deputy chiefs of the fire department there that were like, "Yeah, we saw this." And this this book that um, I based it this episode on, which is the world's most haunted house. Mm-hmm. Um, there's, it's just filled with quotes from uh, police officers and firefighters that witness this stuff that say that I, I will never forget it, you know, and um, it's pretty, it's pretty crazy. That's always, that's always compelling. And not to keep going back to Enfield, but the same thing with Enfield, you had police officers that witnessed, and that was how the case started getting taken seriously was once the press had heard that police had verified hauntings going on at the house. And that's where it kind of snowballed and, and when it was taken seriously and validated basically so right that's not, even just so because how... they're, not even just because they're cops though but because they're a like impartial third party right. like they're just a random group that are coming to the house right so i mean it's gonna be cops or something to that aspect that are coming but any impartial third party that's coming there that can 
that can validate what's going on, I would I would say is very helpful to the case. Right. So the, like Dave said, like I wouldn't trust people who go up to the windows like, oh, I saw something move. It's like, well, you're just you might just be trying to get a rise out of the crowd or something or you're just trying to feel special. Um, I wouldn't trust. I mean, not that I don't trust the Warrens in their track history, but they're going there looking for ghosts. You know, they want to find ghosts. Right. That's I that's why really I believe what, what they say. And this is why. I'm, yeah. Why I'm agreeing with you. Yeah. And, um, you know, even the psychical research people, I mean, they're also there to look for ghosts. I mean, they're also there to partially debunk it as well or, or validate it. But it's the that's why it's like when it comes to police officers or an impartial party, I think that brings more validation to the case. Yeah, I mean, there's the psychical research team that came in from Duke University to actually like study this to f determine whether or not they think it is actual haunting. They are trying to debunk it. Like that's their job. It's their job to like you get you get an A plus if you can debunk this because they want these these people. You know, they believe it. They're all in but they want real stuff. They don't want to be, um, you know, they don't want to be taken lightly. Yeah. They're not doing it for like a network TV show. They're not doing it for a wacky YouTube video or clickbait or anything like that. So that makes sense. Do you want to stop calling us out? They're not us. <laughs> I forgot we're a wacky YouTube channel. Sorry, I'd like to say that we call a spade a spade and we, we call it bullshit when we see it. Um, I think we're we pretty good at that. We call a whispering swan statue a whispering swan statue. We do. Mm -hmm. um, so, and on that topic, I am usually, I usually have the Warrens back. I usually try and, you know, we go back to the Amityville episode. I did a whole thing where I, you know, what after the debunkers of the Warrens and uh, of that case there. This one isn't it for me. Um, I've actually been referencing this Lindley Street case since I think episode one or two. Um, mm -hmm. As to what, like, this is, this case is one of the reasons why I'm not all in on the Warrens. And it's because of the, when she, when Lorraine Warren got caught burning her own hand under hot water. So that was one of the things that the girl would, um, admitted to the cops who were interrogating her about what she said she saw. Now she did, uh, claim that she faked more things than she could have. She said she faked the, uh, levitating refrigerator, which, uh, these refrigerators in 1974 weighed about 300 pounds. So there's just no way if if a room full of police officers firefighters and adults saw a levitating refrigerator there's no way that a 10 year old girl is faking that it's just impossible i don't know so, how anyone could fake that you can't fake it and that was another one of the quotes in the book was just they this you can't fake some of this stuff like even if you have like me who has no problem lifting a 300 pound refrigerator right. like sure. if i were to lift it with my wonderfully strong definitely not defective arms and unbelievably <laughs> strong legs and back like you, you would see all of a sudden you just see my feet like you know i'm lifting up the fridge you know my arms are around the front of the fridge how are you lifting up a fridge without being exposed what, I, what i'd like to say real quick um is I don't really take your word for this, Jesse, as I watched a magician do the same trick to you about 15 times the other night and an equivalent of him just throwing <laughs> something over his back and you I just freaking out every time. Oh, I'm glad you finally know how, by the way. And I, uh, I'll be back in a second. By the way, I can I can do Rob, Rob's connection is getting weird. He's, he's that cursed chair finally worked out for you, Dave. Oh, the cursed um, chair. Perfect. Yes. Not only not that. only did I know how he did it. I learned it myself and I pulled it off on uh, my kids the other day so I oh, can fool awesome. kids. That Boom. is good. That is That's, pretty good. That is pretty good. Um, I'm a magician. Add that to my bio. Yeah. So what Rob was referring to is when we were in Block Island, we were at a uh, at a restaurant after, and there was this magician who followed us around all night showing us magic tricks. There, he was pretty good. He was a good magician. He's very good. Yes. Uh, also not a, a normal occurrence to have a magician follow you around for an evening. An evening. Okay, so so I, I gotta know. All right, so this was during our Block Island trick, and as sure. soon as Rob gets back in here, we'll discuss this further. But he had asked us for a ride from one bar to the next bar because this is a small island. Everyone knew what everyone was doing. We just met this guy. He's like, "Oh yeah, I heard you guys are going to this bar." After we're like, "Yes, we are." Okay, word gets around fast around this small island. So he was the magician, and we knew this. They had one magician on the island, and that was him. Cool guy. And uh, also named Rob. So we're at this bar and he's like, okay, can we get a ride to the next bar? We're like, sure. And we're waiting in the car for him. We're like, where's this guy? And then like, we didn't see him. We're like, ah, whatever. He'll, he'll figure out a way. So we drive to the next bar. And as a joke, I'm like, how much you want to bet? Like when we get there, like as, because he's a magician, he's just going to show up. He's already there. And sure enough, we walk in and he walks out of the bathroom and we're like, oh man, 
he, this, he did. He just showed up out of nowhere. And then he's like, oh, yeah. He's like, the trick is if you go into the bathroom at the other bar, you come out of the bathroom here. We're like, oh, I wonder, <laughs> do you think he planned that all along? I don't oh, know. If he he's an illusionist. That. He's an <laughs> illusionist. That's what they do. I they told that story you. to someone at work and he immediately was like, oh, dude, he planned that from the beginning. I was like, oh, maybe he did. Maybe he did. Mm, I did by the magician yeah. yet again. That was like one of the four times he got me that night. Four times let's, he got you that night. Let's, let's, let's move moving on. on. <laughs> um, so, yeah. So the so the Warrens, um, Lorraine Warren faking getting her hand burned. Um, I believe that. I believe she did fake that. And um, I don't I don't think that everything the Warrens do is fake. But I think that in a lot of these cases, they they like to pump them up for the media attention. Now they don't, they always brag. Like when we go on these cases, we don't take money. We're helping these people free of charge. But the reason they're doing it is to boost their names for fame. That way, when they do these lectures, they can go to these colleges and get paid massive amounts of money for these lectures because they have the big name that they create by going to these cases and pumping them up. So um, I do believe that while what a lot of what they do is, was legitimate and um, they would go there and kind of basically pump these things up, which is a lot of what you see these kids doing, like in the Enfield case. And in this case is the kids are getting all the attention. They're enjoying the attention. So they take something that might be real and they just add to it by, you know, pushing the TV with their yeah, foot. They're, a little they're bit also or, kids. But when they're getting attention for something, they keep doing it until you inform them like, hey. It's not, it's not funny anymore. You know, <laughs> they, they'll just keep doing it. Like if, if a kid says a funny joke and everyone laughs, they're going to keep saying that joke over and over again because like, oh, it worked. They think I'm funny. You know, it's just just how kids react. And I could see that, especially if you have a case. Um, how long did this haunting go on for? This haunting went on from, uh, I think it went on for six or seven years. So it started oh in the um, mid 60s. It got, and then, you know, 1971, I think was when the two girls were on the couch and the couch started levitating. And then 1974 is when it went like really big when the Warrens got involved and everything. So it went on for a long time, but it wasn't it wasn't really crazy until that last the last those last couple of months in 1974. Um, the couch had a happy ending though, because at that way at that point the kids were very awkward. One of them just didn't even talk, right? And then the couch levitated. They experienced that haunting together, and then they became like really good friends after that, right? Yeah, for a short period of time, and then um, she became reclusive um after that and that's when she just basically had no friends and part of it was because the mother wouldn't let her have any friends the mother was um i think doing her best but this person was not i think um mentally ready to adopt the child because she had just lost just her lost other her. child and was just not ready she you know she wouldn't let the girl out of her sight wouldn't let her have friends because she was afraid she was going to die so um, i can see a, that yeah it was a really unfortunate situation um for i think somebody that you know genuinely meant well but it's understandable i mean imagine like the i mean obviously the mental toll it takes on you to lose one kid and then if you know on your second run around you're like i'm not screwing this up so i mean i i could see how that would uh that would be obviously it's not the best way to raise a kid but you know who am i to say it's just i you know unimaginable grief that i never want to deal with so it's rough yeah exactly um, so back to the poltergeist thing. Have you guys heard the poltergeist theory of why, of like where, what they are? So the, the uh, psychical research, uh, the psychical researcher Frank Podmore proposed the naughty little girl theory for poltergeist cases, uh, many of which have seemed to be the center on, uh, seem to center on an adolescent, usually a girl. Um, he found that the center for the disturbance was often a child who was throwing objects around to fool or scare people for attention, um, and that's the skeptical theory. But the parapsychological theory is that uh, when you have uh, like an adolescent teenage girl the, that they have trip, trip a troubled adolescent fe uh, female girl female girl right? an adolescent teenage girl um, that's troubled they would that negative energy is what um, manifests the poltergeist so that's why I think you see right. a lot of these cases like Enfield like Lindley Street with the troubled teenage girl yeah, you know, it's always that, that, it's always that age too. So yeah, if you look up like the definition of, of poltergeist or look up different theories on when they're created and how they're created, it's usually girls around that age when they're going through puberty. And um, it's the same thing with Enfield, same age group, same situation going on there. Exactly. And I don't know why it's um, specific to females because I guess teenage males have lots of built up negative energy also if they're uh, troubled. But 
I don't know. I didn't write the theory. That's just it, and it exists. We don't make the rules. We don't make the rules. Someone on Wikipedia does. Exactly. Um, what are your thoughts on this one, Rob, as far as hoax or legitimate? I think the problem in lies with anything else. So where you start having some perceived hoaxes and you're like, and you're able to debunk some of it, then you get the problem of people trying to debunk everything, which is fair. Obviously you should be trying to debunk everything, but we still have cops to this day from that time frame that say that they saw stuff that they can't explain. And again, how were they making the, how are they making some of this heavy furniture levitate and stuff? So it feels like it's another one, just like Enfield. And we keep going back to it because it's so paralleled that stuff might've happened. And then people might've just added on to the legacy type deal because people want, again, people peeking in the window. They want to be part of the story, right? Everybody always wants to be part of the story. So they are adding to it like, Oh, I saw this. I saw this. Um, and then you almost feel under pressure too, right? Like I, I sort of felt this at the house in Bridgewater. I never did anything to like make stuff happen, but like we would bring people in like to the house, some of our friends and we'd be like, this house is scary, you know, stuff happens. And it's like, well, what if nothing happens this night? Because not every night things that we had a experience would happen. You know what I mean? And it's like, mm -hmm. uh, you, it's kind of a letdown to those people if they don't experience it. Yeah, so I remember maybe... we, we were up there in the attic one time doing the whole ghost investigation thing and everyone was like terrified. And then all of a sudden there's like a slam on the wall behind me. I'm like, oh my God. And it was just fucking Keith who just threw a battery just to mess with us. I mean, these things happen, you know, like, yeah. when, you're, when you, if you can get people riled up, it's, it's going to happen. Happened yeah. at the conjuring house. Like one of the, uh, <clears throat> one of the people that worked there, like banged on the wall when he was coming downstairs. Cause he was a tool. And, uh, <laughs> <clears throat> And uh, and I and I immediately was like, dude, don't do that. Don't, that's not what I'm here for. I'm like, I'm actually trying to find some legitimate stuff. I don't need you doing that. Please fuck off. And that was kind of the end of it. Right. So so that's kind of where I'm at. I'm like, there. It probably started off as legitimate, and there's some legitimate stuff. But you muddy the waters when you start doing stuff just to expand upon the story. So that's that's what I. I think it's legit. I just think we need to be careful about which evidence we think was legit and not legit too legit to quit it's thanks rob it's difficult when um when you do that no no it's difficult when <laughs> when uh when there's a few instances of the kids pranking because then everyone wants to write everything off and and it's you know when it's verified that you know she was moving the tv stand with her foot or whatever or pretending that the cat can talk it's difficult to not then say well this whole thing is a hoax because we caught her messing around but it's like you cannot debunk the furniture you cannot debunk the fridge behind this girl you know you, again you would have to have multiple family members police being involved with this for it to be an actual mm -hmm. hoax don't say right. that and the police when they declared it an official hoax that was the um the brass up top coming to the lower guys saying wrap this up like we can't we're, we're wasting way too many uh resources here this crowd is out of control we need this to get we need this to end so the first time they got one little thing, which was just her pushing the TV with her little toe, uh, they were like, that's it. That's what we need. Get her, get the confession out of her, get this to be a hoax, get it wrapped up. And that's what they did. That's exactly what they did. They just, they said she admitted to the cat. She admitted to moving the TV. It's a hoax. And um, I can see that too. So, so it's like from the, from their angle as well, it's like, they just want this thing to go. They got 4,000 yeah. people crowded outside of this house. They have to do police detail. They have to pay these officers to be out there. They have to take time away from other cases that could definitely use their attention to go deal with this. Ma if it wasn't for the massive crowd, I don't think they would have been so quick to try to write it off. Yeah. Right. And we all know those police details ain't cheap. So it's yeah. true. that's the other thing with that. So I, I think that's what it is too. So that's that's where I stand on it with all the stuff I was looking into on this case. It's like, I think it's legit, but then you have all the other stuff along with it. And that's what ruins some of the stuff, right? Like the, the whole name of the of the brother thing as a joke, that's fine because it's just a joke. You're going to tell them afterwards like, no, no, the officer told me to say that and everything. And uh, can you block Brie real quick? Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but when you're going to the lengths of 
burning your own hand or causing stuff like that to occur, then you are doing more harm than good and trying to a help the family. That should be the number one priority, right? If it's that bad that, you know, they're constantly getting all their possessions broken and they don't have the money to replace this stuff. That should be your number one priority is to help this family in some way to get it to stop. And B, you should be looking at realistically, like trying to find a way to study this, to understand it better. But now you've ruined all that. You've, you've tainted the, the, um, the experiment or whatever. Yeah, you what was, it. what was Lorraine's story after she got called out for the burning hand situation? Uh, she just, she denied doing it to herself. And the, um, the, the, uh, rebuttal to that was was no we were sitting at a table with five other people that all saw the burn appear on her hand so um it was with the but the, the people that she was sitting at the table with were like the people that worked for them so it's you know like a paulino was came with them uh father charbonneau came with them um so i mean i don't know if like the priest was in on it but uh i think most likely this is just my me taking a guess is that she did burn the hand uh, under the hot water? The girl mm -hmm. did see it because that's this oddly specific thing for a girl to, you know, for the girl to make up. And she probably had it hidden under her uh, shirt sleeve, and then said, "Oh my, my hand! There's a burn on my hand." You know, just all everyone's like, "Oh wow, that's crazy!" There it is. You know what I mean? Mm. Does that make sense? Maybe. Yeah. I mean, how hot can you get that water? For, I mean, I know the water from the sink can get hot, but is it going to be that hot to actually leave a burn? Maybe she saw her pour it uh, out of a tea kettle. I don't know. Maybe. Yeah. I mean, so props for dedication there, I guess, but I don't know. Got to go all out. Yeah. Matthew Thomas know. brought up a, a good point earlier in the chat. I want to see if I can find it. He said, what if the ghost was the child that died and was mad and felt replaced by the adopted child? Uh, that was actually one of the theories in the book. And mm -hmm. it was like, they just kind of, glazed over it real quick and then moved on and they were like no it's demon no it's a poltergeist but i'm like that was a pretty good yeah. angle i guess yeah. you know the kid feels like he's replaced or something and you know who knows how maybe he's a jealous ghost i don't know but uh, i thought that was a pretty good um angle that they kind of just i didn't even think of that that that's that is that is very interesting because it lasted the whole time that child was in the house right because the thing i saw was even as like the publicity of this thing died down the haunting didn't die down the haunting nope. lasted um well beyond that so they even tried to sell the house at one point yep they sold they the house were... sorry i didn't mean to cut you off I, I don't think they were able to sell the house from what i heard yeah, so it was a weird time. But the '70s was, you know, in the satanic panic. Nobody wanted to buy a haunted house. I was just gonna say, like, it's too bad they weren't trying to sell it now because they could probably sell it for fifty million dollars. Because everybody <laughs> wants to buy that haunted house so they could rent it out for ghost investigations. Right. But back then, nobody it was nobody wanted it. You know, because mm -hmm. the uh, house still stands today. The house is still there today. The um the uh the Goodens are dead. The parents are dead, and the daughter, as soon as she turned eighteen, she moved back to Canada to find her real family, and no one ever heard from her again. She um, also died. They found her. She she died as natural causes at fifty one years old. Really, I didn't know that. Yeah, I, I looked into that earlier today. She disappeared for a long time when they were writing the book. He was trying to find her, never did. They ended up finding her. Oh my God, I forget where. I might have been Canada. But yeah, they ended up uncovering that she died of natural causes. Um, 2015, oh, I think wow. sounds right. So yeah, yeah. I'm not going to do that math. So I'll take your word for it. Well, that's a sad ending to the story. That is a sad ending to the story. It was a, it was a sad ending to the story anyway, that she just moved out when she was 18 and went back to find the family. The family that um, put her up for, she was one a child, one of nine children, and they only put her up for adoption, which is just crazy. I don't know yeah. what I mean, but then she went back. She's like, I got to find this family. It's like, maybe you shouldn't. I think they, they yeah. think you chalked that one up in the lost column, but uh, I don't know. Maybe she found them. Maybe it worked out. Who knows? Uh, yeah, the, the, uh, the mother for, had a, uh, the mother went out there tragic. with eight kids. I guess, oh my I, guess God. I guess that's a number right there. <laughs> <laughs> the, the mother had a tragic end. She died in a car accident in like 91, I believe. And then the father died of natural causes in like 94. My years might be off, but it's those are roughly, that's roughly the timeline. Yeah, that's pretty rough. 
That is pretty rough, but I think so. That sounds right. That sounds pretty much uh, exactly what I had heard. So this, uh, so this one and Enfield are like the two biggest poltergeist cases that you can find if you're looking into them. And uh, this one claims to be the best documented. I saw a couple people in the chat earlier when I had said best documented um, poltergeist story ever. They were like, "Wait a minute, what about Enfield? Enfield was however how long was Enfield? Eighteen months long. There." It's like the actual haunting was longer in uh, Enfield, but this one was researched by um, universities and you know on on site doing the the tangible research, finding evidence. So that's I think why they consider it to be the best documented case. Enfield yeah. being the number two, and then you also have um, the Edinburgh one at the uh, Greyfriars Churchyard. That one has that. That one only has a couple hundred, though. Like uh, documented poltergeist things, only a couple hundred. The, <laughs> Wait, um, what? <laughs> en Enfield had a couple thousand, I believe, that were documented. But, um, yeah, I, I a couple thousand it. what? A couple thousand what? What are you? What are you? Par paranormal, paranormal instances. So that, that. Oh, okay. Yeah, I think I, it was I, like two, that, that Morris and Gross that they had a uh, or Morris Gross and uh, Playfair, they had documented two like there's two thousand things happening like like chair moves. So I don't, I don't, I don't think whatever. the way I don't think that's how they're measuring like what is the best document. So it's not like one thousand things happened here versus one thousand one hundred things happened here. I think it's how many different researchers researched this case and found tangible evidence. Okay, yeah, I can see that. So I think that's the metric they go by. That's fair. Yeah. So it's it's a hell of a story. It's a great one for our fiftieth episode. I think a little, a little um milestone for us here i know it is this one and then 52 i guess would be the the big milestone that's you i do 50 is more fun i do like this little interaction between matthew and ricardo where um matthew said most documented ever and ricardo said why did i hear that in jericho's voice matthew which is fun <laughs> because we are we're recording with chris jericho this week that's right mm -hmm. yeah, that's exciting jericho. That yeah, exciting. Yeah, of the uh, Chris Jericho podcast. It'll be fun. Yeah. All right. Anything else on this case, gentlemen? I think that about covers it. Yeah. I think That's a good one. Yeah. That is a good one. Very different yeah. one. Um, do we want to hit some of our five star reviews for the week? Yeah. Quick? All right. So we got two this week. So the first one is from B Crane. Uh, it's titled A Really Awesome Podcast. By far one of the best podcasts, period. The first part of my shift, I work alone, and I've always dreaded it. Since finding hometown ghost stories, it has made those four hours very enjoyable and look forward to going to work and listening to the podcast. Um, weirdly, that one kind of hit me a little differently. Like, the, I love all of our reviews, but, like, that's just, like, the genuine spirit of that one. It's like, man, people really do like the show. So I want to just say again to everybody, thank you for listening because it's amazing. We're, we're approaching a year, and... I think we've grown a bit bigger than we even anticipated to be in a year. So we want to thank everybody that that has been here to join us. Yeah. Welcome uh, in Julie. She says happy 50th. Just found this channel slash podcast. Love it. Uh, thanks, Julie. Thank Welcome. Thanks, Julie. Welcome. The other one is from Ashy Nicole. Amazing show. I absolutely love this show. I've been listening to it all day at work for the past few weeks. Hearing some of the history behind these places makes the stories that much more interesting then listening to the guys talk and joke after is the best. Definitely giving me a great list of new places I want to visit. Us too. There's so many places that we've covered that I need to get to. Um, yeah. Whether it's going. the Sally House, I want to get to Australia to go to Juni. Uh, it, it just it doesn't end. Every time we do a place, the, the castle we just covered last week, it's like, oh man, I kind of want to go to England just to see this yeah. castle now. Go hit that castle, visit the Swansea Devil. Yeah, like Sick. how do it, it's just. There's so many cool stuff. And if you live in an area with some stuff like this, everybody does. A lot of people put off going to do this stuff. They're like, oh, I live so close. I can do it anytime. Go do it. A lot of people fall into that trap. You'll go You'll go to places. You can come to Massachusetts, right? And people around us will be like, oh, I love going. You can to stay Salem. at Rob's house. Uh, maybe. We'll see. Uh, we'll see what Gotham says about that. Um, but people in Massachusetts, people that we know that have lived there their entire lives, like we love going to Salem and they'll be like, I've never been We're like, it's an hour away. 
how have you not how have you not been to salem massachusetts you live an hour from it it is one of the most historical places in our entire country how do you not go check this out like so i think that happens like it, it's just things are so close to you that you just overlook it don't do that go out see these things have a lot of, like bring your friends just have a you know have a ball go go and experience this stuff yeah you'd be surprised how many haunted locations are in every single state and like in in the 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 world is is changing with these things too it's like before it was like oh there's that haunted house but you know it's all blocked off and they don't allow people now it's like a lot of these locations are not only welcoming people in they're doing mm -hmm. tours they're doing overnight stays they've turned it into you know like the lizzie borden house you can just book a room like it's a hotel like it's there's so many places like this or you have haunted hotels if you can't find one near you. So there's always something. Uh, real quick, let me thank our patrons. We have our VIPs. We have Jimmy H, Justin T, Lisa J, Mom and Pops, Wilkins, and Stephen V. Mm -hmm. uh, for other ones, we have Jake V, Mike B, Stephanie A, Sydney B, Church of the Stephanies, uh, Anthony Angry, Dave Rocks T, Brandon W, Captain McSlugs, Cody G, Kiralee J, Mark M, Matthew T, Mariah M, Papa Squatch, Rachel B, Sarah, Dave Loves Bacon R, Sarah Wilson, um, Soph M, Hooper, and I think that's it. The list was in a different order this week, so it kind of threw me off, but I think I got everybody. So thank you guys. If you're interested in getting your name in the credits and uh, read out by me like this sometimes, um, yeah, uh, for as little as $3 a month, you can jump in on Patreon. For the $10 and up tiers, we're having another Patreon pre-show hang out which has been a great time every week we have a, a good amount of people that hop in there we hang out and just talk about whatever usually we just hold our dogs in front of the camera <laughs> the way, and it's it's a good time so yeah. and we watch uh we watch stephanie's kids climb all over it's good yeah. it's good stuff good stuff. good stuff what's next week uh next week we are doing uh fox hollow farm a little serial mm -hmm. killer slash haunted location which should be an interesting one so i'm gonna be in florida next week um for the universal what is it um halloween horror halloween, nights halloween horror nights which is gonna that's be awesome. the thing so, i need to do yeah yeah i'm excited for that so i'm going down there i'm going to be doing some live streams from it so you guys can check out do a little walkthrough on some of those things and uh we'll, we'll see how it goes man we're, go we're going with the kids so i don't know how we're going to handle these haunted houses i think the only way we're going to be able to do it is me and the wife are going to have to go in one at a time to these haunted houses which sounds 10 times more scary so i'm gonna be going so low to these on i'm not gonna skip it man this is like some of the best ones in the world yeah so. yeah you can't skip. Yeah, just drag drag the kids in frankie one or two frankie will appreciate it frankie probably would so either way yeah we'll, we'll make it happen it's gonna be a good time are you but gonna yeah. not be here we can talk about this off air are you not gonna be here tuesday no, just i will not I'll, I'll be in florida so I, i'm gonna try to tune in from florida i have i'll bring stuff to do so Hmm, but I don't know. I don't know what my situation is going to be. So it might be like a little cameo appearance, but I don't want you guys to have noises of Universal Studio in the background the entire episode. So that wouldn't be great quality. Uh, Matthew right. T brought this up and he brought, I think someone else brought it up earlier. He says you guys should do a live in person audience episode. So that's in the works with, um, with Bloody Disgusting um, or Bloody FM the network that we signed with. So we've been talking about setting up different live things and everything and everything's kind of mumble jumbled right now because it's october well, and that whole network is crazy in october and the other thing that he had brought up was uh do it for episode 100 that would be a really cool episode 100 is do an in-person uh episode so if you're in massachusetts or in the general area um me and dave are going to be doing a live talk on during a ghost tour on saturday night this week so if you're interested in that I can get you in contact with the people that get tickets for that, but the tickets are limited and I think they're close to sold out. So if it's something you're interested in, you'd have to be close to Bridgewater, Massachusetts. That's where the ghost tour is going to be. It's very, that's why I haven't been pitching it too much because it's so specific to just here and it's not our thing. Um, so yeah, if, if that's something you'd be interested in, we are going to be talking on there for about 20 to 30 minutes. Bro dad brings up that Frankie, who's, that's my son. He says, uh, Frankie won't even go into his grandmother's closet with the scary dollies. Oh, I probably seen, have you seen either. the dolls? That's yeah. that not, yeah. I wouldn't want to go in there either. Yeah, it sounds the awful. Best, better haunted house than the uh, regular. I won't go into the closet. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, so yeah, that's good. And then we have our Salem episodes coming up the following two weeks, which this is what's going to kill us as we try to put all this together. That just <laughs> stressed me out. This. Yeah. So we got to. Yeah. Figure that stuff out. So we got a, yeah. we got a lot 
a lot coming up. So, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So we'll be back um, Friday. We're going to drop. I don't even know at this point. Um, we're doing Curse multiple episodes a week. So we're going to be dropping Curse Possessions. We're going to be dropping a horror yeah. oh. review and probably a history of ghosts as well. So just stay tuned. Yeah. There'll be content uh, probably like every other day um, going forward. So we'll see. So there's going to be a lot of stuff. Keep an eye out. If you're in the Discord, you'll get notifications on everything that we upload. So, and then this, we'll always. This Friday, is, this Friday will be a barbarian review. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. The barbarian oh, review. Yeah, Patrons so get the week ahead for the curse possession we've made this so confusing <laughs> we have there's gonna be stuff look out for the stuff join the discord if you want live updates on the stuff and obviously on patreon you'll get the stuff before other people get the stuff uh that'll pretty much do a gentleman anything else now just the we're gonna so on top of all that stuff we're dropping even more stuff on patreon so like if you're a patreon member you get a few more things more starts and on patreon you get ad free stuff that's a new thing so uh, yes uh, for all tiers you get um ad free episodes so i know that there isn't many ads i know youtube just always has ads but on uh the podcast you've probably noticed one or two sprinkled in here and there but to get those ad free patreon boom no problem yeah anything else gentlemen that's Cheers. gonna do it for me thank you all for tuning in to episode 50 of hometown ghost stories many more to come and we'll see you next time peace What's up, guys? Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed that video. Make sure you hit like, subscribe, turn on the notification bell so you know when we go live for brand new episodes, which we do every Tuesday night, 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. If you want to be in on the live chat, join in the fun and games, get your comments up on the screen. Make sure to join the live broadcast of the show every single week, Facebook, YouTube, and Twitch. We are live, so join us. I hope you liked it. Also, for as little as $3 a month, you can join us on Patreon and get your name officially in the credits. What more could you want? Well, for a few more dollars, you can get extra perks, some swag, additional side content, early access, all that kind of fun stuff. It's all available on Patreon. So swing by. Thank you guys again for watching. We'll talk to you soon. Bye. <laughs>